Yes. Okay. Uh, at this time, I'd like to call the um, January 21st, 2021 meeting of the Victoria Planning Commission to order. Uh, could we take the roll, please? Mary Ann Wyatt. Present. Michael Atkinson. Present. Gail Hode. Present. Vic Caldwell. Present. Brittany Dearlam. Dr. Derek Hunt. Present. Brian Ogie. Present. Brian Rokita. Present. Cynthia Staley. Present. We have a quorum. Um, before we begin our meeting, I'd like to have one announcement regarding participation. If you wish to participate in the citizen communication segment of tonight's meeting or any of the public hearings that we will hold, you'll need to do so through video conference. We have set up this virtual format to limit social gatherings and protect our citizens and city employees from COVID-19. To access the video conference during citizen communication, visit www.zoom.com from your web browser, select join a meeting located at the top of your browser and input 9590328 7216 for the meeting ID. Select join followed by open Zoom and then join with computer audio. Click on the, lab the icon labeled participants to access the option to raise your hand at the bottom of the screen. When we have a public hearing, once you click raise hand, our moder moderator will announce you by your username and you'll be given your cue to begin speaking to the council. Comments will be provided with audio only. There will not be an opportunity at this time to share your screen or any additional presentations. Please remember to silence any cell phones, televisions, or other background noises so that we can hear, clearly hear your comments. Thank you. At this time, we'd like to open the citizen communication portion of the meeting. Is there anyone that would like to speak to the uh, commission on any item that's not on the agenda? Celeste, do you see anyone? No, we do not have anyone that has raised their hand for items not on the agenda. Okay, thank Mary you. Ann? Yes. Uh, I'm not sure whether it's best to do this now or wait until we get to the consent agenda, but I'd like to request that we pull uh, item D3. I believe that we'll get to that after we um, deliberate on the variance. That would, okay. be, that would be something we do after we take up that agenda item that's on the... Uh, agenda tonight, but we'll, we won't forget it. Okay, and then I also have um, uh, just to ask, I guess Julie, because she's she's the face I'm looking at right now. Um, Julie, could you refresh my memory because it's been a while since I've had to think about it that way, and and I couldn't find my notes. Um, could you go over like the what a lot is with regard to the city code uh, with such things like as setbacks, fence requirements, uh, land, you know, like uh, for example, if, if I build a building on a, on a property, do I have to have so much physical land left over after I build the building or can I make the whole lot building? Um, sure, so we don't have um, Florida area ratio requirements, which is I think what you're referring to. We do have minimum law standards that generally deal with lot width, lot depth, um, and square footage. And so when uh, the city is looking to issue permits and um, you know, the development of a lot, we just look at minimum standards and, and can the lot be developed according to the city's minimum standards. Um, you know, of course, there's tons of neighborhoods within Victoria and they're, they all have very different characteristics. And so um, neighborhood characteristics are really developed at you know, the preliminary plat stage and, and can vary widely. And we don't really regulate neighborhood um, characteristics. That's really up to the developer as long as they meet those minimum standards. And okay. um, if something doesn't meet a minimum standard, then of course it comes before the commission in the form of a variance. So what about uh, setbacks? I know, I'm pretty sure, I think it's five foot on the sides, but I couldn't remember what the front and back was. So generally 20. Um, it, it does also depend on, you know, if it's a collector uh, arterial street, if it's commercial or if it's residential, but residential front setback is generally 20 feet. Um, and so, you know, a, a 6,000 square foot lot, which is our minimum standard, can easily accommodate 
um, residential structures once you apply all of those bulk requirements, such as setbacks, off street parking, um, and all of those minimum standards. And is there a minimum, uh, let, let's say I've got a 75 foot wide uh, frontage on the street. Is there a, a ratio or a minimum for size of driveway? Or is it just based on whatever structure I build? No, we do have a maximum driveway width of 24 feet for residential. Um, so if you if someone is building a house that requires, you know, three or four off street parking spaces because it's a very large house, then that those off street parking that off street parking had to be deeper. It couldn't be wider um, because you are limited to the maximum at the actual road frontage. And so you have to, you know, build a, a longer driveway essentially if you are required to do more than two um, off street parking spaces okay. with the general minimum requirement. And barring any utility easements, what's the setback on the back of the property? Typically? Generally 10 feet. Sorry? Generally 10 feet. Okay. I got a little diagram here I'm, I'm doodling on. So, all right, great. Thank you, Julie. Anything else? Uh, at this time, let's go to development items with public hearings on the agenda. Our first item is a variance request for the Beck Williamson subdivision number one, resubdivision number one. Uh, may we please have the staff report? Yes. The first item on here is the Beck Williamson subdivision request for a variance on minimum lot size for the total lot. This subdivision is located at 104 Basin Street within the city limits of Victoria. The homeowner is proposing a variance to the total area required for a lot. This homeowner was granted a conditional contract with the General Land Office to have their existing structure that was damaged during Harvey demolished and rebuilt into a new one. The General Land Office has approached this particular lot was originally platted, but was platted with a 30 foot setback. The reason they are asking for a replat is to adjust their setback lines. However, with the replat and the demolish, they asked to replat into the current standards with the 20 foot setback to allow for a more buildable space. Staff is recommending approval to this variant. Currently the lot sits at 5,671 square feet total, just below the minimum 6,000 required. Staff does not feel that it would be detrimental to the existing lots around it as this lot will stay the same as it was previously with just adjusting its building lines. Any questions? I don't have any questions. Guess it helps about you. Um, Celeste, this is going to be subject to the the final uh, design that the state's going to provide us. Is that correct? Yes, correct. I forgot to ask that about the last one that came up like this, where the it was a state program, and uh, I meant to ask it, so I'm going to ask it this time. So good. I think it's great. Yes. Yeah, uh, their final designs will fit within all those setbacks. Okay. Any other questions? At this time, we'd like to open the public hearing on this agenda item. Uh, if you wish to speak to this item, please use your raise your hand feature on Zoom. Do we have anyone who would like to speak on this agenda item? Wyatt, it does not look like we have anybody that has chosen to raise their hand for this item. All right, at this time, um, is there any further discussion from the commission on this particular agenda item? Uh, if not, may I have a motion? A motion, uh, just take a vote. I'll second. To clarify, that would be a motion to approve? Yes. There's been a motion made by Dr. Hunt to approve and seconded by, um, who was Mike. it? Seconded? Mike Atkinson. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. And just for information, the final plat for this particular agenda item will be approved on the consent agenda. 
since we've approved the variance. Uh, let's me. go now to our second item on the agenda. Excuse me for it a is, second. Pardon me. I apologize. I apologize. No uh, problem. Uh, I didn't hear, um, and maybe I missed it, um, where it was anything on the consent agenda that we wanted to bring to the agenda. Has that been mentioned already? No, the, the consent agenda is actually set for the meeting. Um, and in this instance, for instance, we just approved the variance on this item number one. So on the consent agenda will be the, the approval of the plat for that particular uh, item. Now, it, when we get to the consent agenda, if someone wants to take something off it, we can have a motion to have something taking off it. Okay, yes, ma'am. That's why I, I didn't know if that, that, that passed yet. So, okay, thank no, you. Sir, no, sir, that'll be really the last thing we take up. Okay. okay, at this time, we'd like to have item number two, the variance request for Lake Forest subdivision, section one, phase two, resubdivision number two, resubdivision number one. Maybe we have the staff report, please. Yes, this is a variance request to section 21-82A2 on minimum lot width, which requires single family residential lots to be 50 feet in width. This particular subdivision is located at 99 Lake Forest Drive. The applicant has requested a variance to replot a single lot into two single family residential lots with minimum lot widths of 49 feet and 49.01 feet, just below the required 50 feet. Staff recommended approval of the variance to this as they were able to meet all other ordinance uh, requirements for a single family lot. Going back to the setback requirements we discussed earlier, they were able to meet all of those. Um, as a reminder, commissioners, we did receive opposition letters to this variance earlier this week that we have sent to all the commissioners for your review. Um, I'm open for any questions. Are there any questions of Celeste? Well, I have uh, I have some questions. Um, um, I actually have a statement uh, moving with it because um, I empathize with all those letters that came in and, and I believe that uh, us commissioners, it's our due diligence to look through everything um, that's uh, that's going with it. Um, I actually even drove by there and reread this entire book today um, to go look at the property uh, visually to uh, to see to uh, go with some of the complaints. Um, and uh, I know that some of the complaints they had was dealing with a safety issue, um, dealing with uh, dealing with the vehicles. This was part of our agenda. But when I drove through there, I noticed that it was already two residential homes that were right there at the gateway. And so it didn't have variance with me, on my opinion, that it, it was a, a safety issue only because you already had existing homes in that in that area before you got to the lots. And I just want to cover this because I know it's uh, people that may want to speak or say on it. Um, and Dr. so that- Dr. Hunt, Dr. Yeah. Hunt, excuse me just one moment. What I think I'd like to do on this agenda item, uh, normally we go ahead and have our public hearing before the co uh, commission actually discusses an item, but it's perfectly fine for us at this time to open discussion for the uh, commission and even entertain a motion. The only thing we can't do is actually vote on the variance before we have a public hearing. So if everyone is in agreement, what I'd like to do at this time is just open it for discussion, this agenda item with the uh, commission. And Dr. Hunt, you basically had, that's basically, in my opinion, you know, a beginning of those discussion items. Uh, does anyone else, do you have any further comments, sir? Yeah, yes, I do. Because okay, sure. <laughs> I really looked at this because, you know, all the emails and reading all the emails and all the concerns that was about it, I wanted to make sure that we did go through it and, and, and look at everything uh, that could be. Uh, and like I said, for the safety, uh, the, the safety hazard, I, I couldn't see that for myself. And I don't know if legal is on here or not, but. Um, I did have a couple questions dealing with the uh, the variance application and this dealing with certain procedures that was in there. On the variance application, um, the owner um, stated that um, uh, one of the statements was that, uh, let me see what else, because I had to write stuff down. On the statement, he said that, uh, that it didn't go against uh, the existing regulations um, for the home association. Yeah. But of course, through all the letters they're saying, and the HOA that I talked to, the HOA that, uh, they stated that um, it did go against the regulations. Um, and I know most of this stuff is a civil, civil, civil matter, but what caught my attention, excuse me for my alarm, uh, what caught my attention 
um, was looking through the procedure books uh, and looking, I think it's section um, uh, section 21 and 30, uh, uh, or dash 31 on page 22 and looking at the, uh, what it had a question was, it said all, what did it say? It said uh, regarding all ordinance and status for subdivisions. Um, and so my, my question would be, uh, wouldn't bylaws can be construed as uh, statutes or subdivisions, at least from my understanding, it's a governing document for that subdivision. Um, and so I don't know if we, we've seen those things or if it's been submitted to the staff or anything. And um, if that could be, um, and if a legal could help with that interpretation, um, because also dealing with deed restrictions, when you look on the application uh, on uh, for the affidavit, is that deed restrictions is uh, is one of those things uh, that's requested on affidavit. So request on that, that can be addressed for me. Yeah, so we we request that applicants um, certify that their applications um, meet deed restrictions as um, a way to bring attention of the fact that there may be deed restrictions for the applicants. Uh, but the city actually has no legal authority to enforce deed restrictions. We are only able to enforce our ordinances. Legal our deed restrictions are um, legal covenants or contracts between you know the the people of that subdivision. Uh, and so the city without any um, you know ordinance that gives us authority to enforce deed restrictions uh, just is unable to do. And so um, the affidavit that we require uh, applicants to sign is just procedurally there to make applicants aware that they need to do their due diligence in researching and finding out whether they're complying with deed restrictions. Um, because if you know we don't we want to make people aware that those things are out there because even if um, we issue a permit uh, that violates someone's deed restrictions while the city has no enforcement power of course neighbors our aggrieved property owners definitely have the ability to then sue uh, their neighbors based on the violation of those deed restrictions is a customer service um, to applicants to make them aware that deed restrictions are something that they need to do their due diligence on, but the, the city does not have any authority to enforce deed restrictions. Well, so, Ms. Julie, would you, uh, would you suggest that um, future that we do make some amendments to that because that interpretation can be very uh, misconstrued on when it's saying the request that that's part of the approval. Uh, a part that that is done. Um, and so, you know, I don't know, but I think that maybe uh, future revenue that should be amended of, of stating that because that could probably go against us in yeah. making it. Uh, we can look at our applications. Yeah. And make sure that, um, okay, sorry, what'd you say? We can make, we can look at our applications and make sure that the applications um, state the city doesn't have the authority to. Dr. Hunt. Yes, ma'am. Dr. Hunt. And I'll just say from my perspective, I have long disagreed with the city's position on not enforcing deed restrictions. And from a legal standpoint, you know, I think you can make arguments both ways. Um, a number of sub number of subdivisions, you know, if, if deed restrictions were filed of record and in place before people bought the properties, you know, I would argue from a legal standpoint, they're enforceable. But at a very at a very minimum, I think as a planning commission, we need to be cognizant of the neighborhood's desire to have their, their neighborhoods follow their deed restrictions. And like in this instance, if this person were to go before to the homeowners association and ask for a variance to do just what he wants to do here, they would obviously deny it. And so he's turned to the city to, to take care of that problem for him. Um, and I, and I, you know, I think we do owe it to people in established neighborhoods who have, you know, bought bought properties to build their homes and enjoy their homes to respect their desires in that in that regard. Regardless of whether we legally can do it or not. Well, and, and that's what and because even looking at, like I said, going through and I reread this and looking through these, even when I looked at the the entryway, um, that you could tell it was some variances that was probably granted because of the, the error is small. Um, but just looking at that particular dealing with the application and dealing with a deed and so many uh, complained about going against the deed and having that inside of our uh, our, our book that we right. look at, 
you know, um, saying that this is part of the, the the application process, and then to see the statement saying that it does go, it's a, it can seem like a. a, a well, I need to clarify that the application also requests the deed and the deed um, is, you know, the meets and bounds that verifies, you know, this is the land that's being talked about and this is the ownership and deeds reference deed restrictions, but applicants actually aren't required to submit the full set of filed deed restrictions. Is that stated in, in, in any documentation? Uh, I have to look at our, our um, affidavits and applications, but we do require the deed to be submitted, and then we do require the applicants to acknowledge whether they have restrictions or not. And I, I thank you. Just that's just awareness that I, you know, and for those that are listening, maybe. You know. <clears throat> Dr. Hunt, if I may ask, you keep referring to a procedure book, but I'm not entirely clear on what it is you are referring to. Are you talking about our city ordinance, or? Yes, I'm talking about the, the division subdivision. Uh, development um, would has the uh, all the planning procedures and the the variance procedures and which covers and that, I guess that would be considered the the the, the ordinance and statutes of um, and uh, I might be pronouncing it wrong but it's uh, for section twenty one um, um, yeah for section twenty one of dealing with the ordinances and okay so, so you're talking about our municipal code is what you're referring to okay we could use municipal code if if we was a municipality uh, we could say the municipal code or we could say you know say that but from my and then from my passive of uh, law enforcement when you have those ordinances or you have those states that is what is considered that you follow by so my concern is that by being in this in this book you know and it's not really clarified on it um that it construed as a problem okay i understand dr Hahn, i i uh want to address a couple of things that you brought up that I too drove through the neighborhood as well as went on to the, the county's GIS system and uh, took a look at the entire subdivision from the air. And I drove through the subdivision at seven o'clock in the evening to see how many cars are parked on the street in that subdivision uh, because I, I, the, the only real big concern I've got is the safety. And I don't know that putting one house or putting two houses on that lot is going to change anything with regard to the, the safety of entering into that subdivision. Um, you, you also mentioned that uh, in the, in the affidavit statement or the statement from the, the, the property owner that they will uh, comply with existing regulations uh, established by the homeowners association. I kind of interpreted that as they're not going to build an apartment building they're not going to build. They're going to stay within the the building uh, part of, of what they're allowed to build, as far as uh, nothing too small, nothing too huge, uh, that, that that type of thing. I, I don't know that. Um, one, I haven't seen the homeowners association documentation and bylaws. Uh, we just have the the word of of some statements of a form letter that was sent out to us by a lot of concerned citizens. And I appreciate that they, they were involved, um, but we don't know exactly what the process is or isn't. And one of the things I've always really hated about homeowners association, having participated in three of them in my life, um, is that it can very easily become a popularity contest. So if you're a homeowner that is not popular with the rest of your uh, resident neighborhood, it's very easy for them to make your life miserable. Uh, very, very easy, if, if, depending on how the homeowners association is structured. Uh, I think, you know, that addresses one of the things you brought up. I, I do agree with you. I think you said that you didn't see that there was any major safety concern. Uh, did I misinterpret that? No, you you were right because when I went through there and I saw that it was already existing homes in that area, uh, dealing with the parking, that one plot right there wouldn't have made a difference because the houses that are in front, right by the gate where it's more narrow at, uh, that's more of a safety hazard. Um, but because that's not the complaint, you know, for me, I didn't see an issue with that. It's just when we went into dealing with 
the deeds and just like I said, trying to do due diligence, you know what I mean, because you have people that are affected by it and sure. um, do due diligence on it. It brought that question up when I started looking at that, those things. And then with regard to the city being involved in enforcing deed restrictions, um, you know, I, I, it's, I, I agree that it's probably an imperfect system, Marianne, but I also remember when Parit bought that lot where the old farmhouse was out on the corner about 20 years ago, and uh, we had to sign a waiver. I don't know if your property was involved or not, but mine was. We had to sign a waiver because the deed restriction on that property said that the property could not be sold to a person of color. I think that I was know. a little bit separate one. Yeah. yeah. That that I don't know that the city. Well, but obviously those are those are totally illegal and are of no consequence. Right, but it's still I've had them for years. It's, yeah, it's, it's, it's the it's the I understand. It's the you know the principle of the matter. Um, and so that, that's why I mean, either we admit it out of, out of what's in context or we clarify, define it more uh, coming up because it can be a conflict. And I'll, I think I'll talk one of the things I noticed is that both of these lots will easily support a house of 2000 square feet uh, with a yard in the front and the back and a two car garage um, based on. on but you are going to basically have zero lot line between the homes. Well, but. You know, which, is, which is very different from the other homes that are right in the area. Sure. If you drive, I, think oh, no, that I actually was, disagree with that. If you drive through, that was one of the other comments is that there is actually a portion of that subdivision behind the, the this particular area that is that is designated for those type of homes. And I think that part of the arguments of the people that I read were that that would detract from the full size homes on lots that are right in well, that area. My, my understanding was is that there hasn't been anything put forward by the property owner as to what type of home he's gonna build. He hasn't said garden home or condo or no, whatever. I mean, I, and as far as your property line, if you go and drive through the neighborhood and particularly it becomes real obvious, if you look at the GIS map online, there are a lot of houses in that neighborhood that have Five foot setbacks, which what I consider zero property line, uh, on both sides of their property. And now front and back, there's there's a lot of variance and indifference there because of the lot variety. But side to side, there are a lot of properties that have just a five foot setback on both sides of their house. So can I make a comment, please? I just want to address what both Dr. Hunt and Vic what you said about the safety issue. We happen to go out there at 7:30. Oh, one night this week. I think it was Tuesday night. And when we were there, what we observed was that it is a low light entrance. That very first house, the big, the large house has a parking court. They have um, the ability to pull in, pull to the right. I don't know if you noticed. And then they pull into their garage. Well, they have ability on their property in front of that house to back out so that they're not forced to back into the road. They pull out, they can pull out and driving forward there that would not be an issue however when we were there there happened to be a, par a car down the road on the side of the street and we drive a sequoia which is an oversized vehicle i understand that but it would have been super narrow had the car been right there on the corner and i believe that those two lots are what 95 feet from the corner so if there happened to be a party going on that could easily uh, not just there, but up and down the street, you could easily have cars parked on the sides of the street. And in the evening, because it is low light, I could totally see that being a safety issue. I don't mean to, to differ, uh, di um, I don't wanna be assert aggressive here, but I think we at least need to think through, okay, is it the best thing to grant that variance or how else can we look at it? I, I was really surprised when I saw the stakes because um, I need to be careful how I say this. So I'm very familiar with subdivisions that are made with minimum lot sizes and 50 foot widths. And the way those um, fill up in the evenings when uh, the driveways are full and so people are parking on the streets, it becomes very narrow very quickly. So I would really encourage us to give, as a commission, to give serious consideration to that safety at that corner. I because the, the corner house doesn't really have an issue. He's got that big parking court, but those other two houses on those 50 foot lots, 
Absolutely, those could be safety issues because people turn off of nursery, at least when I when we were there, one other car, because we sat there and watched for a while, and there were only two other cars that entered, but um, one was at speed and one was a little bit faster than speed. I just think we need to, excuse me, to be careful about that. Okay, I'm well, done. This is, this is Gail Bode. Could I, could I say something just real quick? Uh, I also drove through there and, and I have that exact same concern on safety um if you divide that so i i totally agree so i want to say this i don't believe that we're disagreeing that how can i say this that well let me just say this driving through through there um my my thing is that i would have said that it was a safety hazard if those other houses didn't exist now we understand that the driving way they have driving ways, but that goes off when you call with the offset standard of, uh, and Julie, correct me if I'm wrong, the offset, the parking lot, I mean, the, uh, the driveways, when you go into the driveways, where's the standard of what they're supposed to have uh, regulation wise when it comes. So even when the development of these homes come, they have to follow that standard of dealing with the de development of the, dri the, the driveway. The question was not about because of the driveway, but it's because of that street and because they already had houses where somebody can just park because even though you have a driveway, I have a, a roundaway driveway, but uh, sometimes people like to park on the street and I'd be like, why don't you walk up the, walk up the sidewalk? Right. Uh, <laughs> and so uh, drive up the driveway. And so the concern um, is that for me, why I'm saying it's not a safety issue only because you already have those, it wasn't a safety issue to others in my opinion, because it, 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 so I don't know if that's making any kind of sense. Okay. Um, I hear okay. what you're Cynthia, I'm glad you brought that up because I, I agree with you with the low light. Uh, that, that was something that I had noticed, but that didn't really log in my in my mind. Um, as far as the, you know, the driveway goes, the way, kind of the way I was looking at it is whether you put one one driveway there or two, they're still backing out into the street, and it's still going to be potentially as dangerous as any other community where oh. we have to back out into the street. I understand what you're saying, but the issue for that first house is he's got the parking court. So he pulls out forward. If we did a second house, not my property, I don't know what they're going to do. But if they could figure out a way to not have to back into the street right there, because that median is, I mean, it's, I think it's the third lot before the median goes away. Y'all help me remember. I know the second lot's still in front of the median. I think the third lot is where the median narrows and goes away, right? So to me, that just, it just, uh, having to back out onto that street makes me anxious. It's just it's just two different standards, though. That's what I'm saying. Like oh. we're talking about the driveway versus the street, you know. Um, and Julie, I don't know if you can uh, uh, distinguish that, you know, because I might be saying the terminology wrong. But I know the requirements of the driveways. You have a requirement where it's supposed to be what two two uh, a two car driveway. Um, it's on the size of the house, but generally the minimum is um, two off street parking spaces and your maximum driveway would be 24 feet in width. Um, so procedurally, if the commission were inclined to approve the variance, they could accept staff's re uh, staff report as findings. Um, but they also, the commission also has the ability to impose conditions. So if um, the commission were to feel that, you know, adding some sort of uh, shared driveway so that they, property owners would have to share a common drive that allow, would allow for um, more of a parking court off of the side. Um, I think there's a, a development off of Hanselman that had that, has that, um, as well as Neory Lane. Um, then that condition could could be in place, you can impose any conditions. Or on the flip side, if the commission is inclined to deny the variance because of just the, the lack of support by the neighborhood and um, violation of need restrictions, the commission does not have to offer any reasons for denial and can just also outright deny it. So those are the kind of procedurally the two options. Are there any other comments from any of the other commissioners? I think, I think Julie points out a good point that we have the ability to put condition on, on any uh, variance that, that we put forward. Uh, as a homeowner, if I were in that area, I wouldn't want to see uh, two houses sharing shared driveway. I think that, for lack of a, of a better way that pops into my mind to describe it, that looks cheaper than having two homes in that area. Um, so I, I would be more upset, I think, as a homeowner in the area, if I had uh, 
two houses sharing the same driveway uh, in, in that kind of a situation. But I think it potentially could be a, a solution. So I would like to add in, if I can, uh, Lake, uh, I'm familiar with Lake Forest and the restrictions that it, that it has. I do know that um, if you're looking to build a building, a structure of any kind, it does have to go to an architectural committee to get passed there as well. Uh, so whether we approve this or, or don't approve it, the owner will still have to go to that step and that's when the HOA with the deed restrictions could come in and, and, and decline the request. So keep that in mind as well. Thanks, Brian. That's a great point. I, you have to I just want to say that uh, I don't mind opening and explaining my reasoning behind this uh, before we get to the vote, only because I believe that those that are listening, or those that are waiting on what we say, should know the reasoning of what it is, instead of just saying no or, or yay or whatever. Right. Are there comments from anyone else? I have to add mine and okay, listen to, to, to uh, Vic and, and Mr. Dr. Hunt. Uh, I agree that there's not much of a safety problem there, and it's going to be the concern of the people of that uh, subdivision to deal with it because when something is built there, yes, they do have deed restrictions and they, they are going to review what's done there. I don't know why this guy wants to divide this up into two separate lots. Looks to me like it'd be a lot more valuable as one. It would solve a whole lot of problems, but that's what he wants. Uh, quite frankly, I'm a little confused as to why he wants to cut this down to 49 feet, because quite frankly, if he owns the whole property, and he does, he could just take two feet off of his property, put one foot on either one, and we wouldn't be sitting here making this decision. And we wouldn't be discussing safety issues and so forth, which I, I don't think are particularly a, a concern, but it would put it between him and the, uh, uh, the homeowners association to work this thing out. I, I, I agree with that, Mike. Yeah, I, I do too. I mean, that, and I actually had thought about that. I think he's, I think, I think Julie's probably looking it up. I think he's already at a five foot setback on that side of the property. So he would have had to ask for a variance. But he could just as easily have made one of these lots 50 foot and the other one 48.1 and and had had two lots. That's uh, right. You know, well, by doing what he's done, he's dumped this decision in our lap and pitted us against uh, or in consideration of 18 other households. Because I count up 18 uh, households here for all these letters and, and I'm concerned uh, and I want to give them a fair shot. I, I hope that there be some some comments. I, I hope that the property owner that wants to do this, I hope he appears and testifies before us because I have some questions directly for him as to what's going on and why this needs to be the way it is. So he actually only has 98.01 feet of frontage. So if he, even though he could divide one lot to be 50, the second proposed lot would still not meet minimum 50 foot requirements. So he would be required to do a variance either way. He only actually owns um, 98.01 feet. So the only way to divide that in two would be to seek a variance for either one or both. And he chose to split them straight down the middle. So there's each lot is, is substandard by a foot rather than making one comply and then having a second one at 48 feet. And you know, my, my, my concern with, with, with that is um, for me, I look at it uh, consistency for, for all. And so I know that um, since I've been on and uh, prior to me, that it's been various since passes for things like that. So that is not an issue for me, you know, dealing with the, the 49, uh, the 49. My issue was what I brought up just dealing with the deed things. But, you know, other than that, you know, I believe if we pass somebody else variance for that, then we should deny some, we shouldn't deny anybody else dealing with that, um, that, that footage. Is there any other comments? Uh, does anyone care to make a motion prior to the time we open our public hearing? I move that we accept the variance. Is there a second? I second. Okay, motions are made and seconded. At this time, we're going to open our public hearing on this issue. Um, Celeste, can you see if anyone is there wanting to address the commission? So I'm actually in control tonight. Oh, sorry. <laughs> sorry. Okay. Have them speak. Yeah, so first up we have Diane Jernigan. 
Um, Diane, if you want to unmute yourself, you will be able to address the commission. Hello. Diane, are you able to unmute yourself? James, can you jog my memory on how you unmute by phone? Um, I believe it's unmuting is by pressing the pound button. So not. No, I, I had to do a star six or something like that. Okay, well, okay. Diane is not by phone. She's um, either way. So um, we're going to lower her hand and move on to um, Eileen Stewart. Okay, Eileen, if you unmute yourself, you will be able to address the committee. Hello, are you able to hear me? Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Awesome, awesome, thank you. Well, I live in the neighborhood and unfortunately we have a brand new homeowners association. Um, the builder had been in control of this neighborhood until probably this past weekend or so. It's only been about a week or two that we, we have a brand new homeowners association. And this did not come to the attention of anyone until I believe Monday. Um, there was a recent meeting and one of the guys who is on the brand new board is our neighbor and he brought it to our attention. And so we've tried to share this with other folks in the neighborhood. Um, the, the first point I'd like to make is that when this gentleman purchased the lot, he was well aware of what the deed restrictions were. Um, it's been explained to me that he uh, would like to have his parents live with him and that another idea that he had was to build a home that had a guest house for them. So it would be a normal home on the full sized regulation lot. Um, and that would accommodate him having his parents live with him. Once, once a structure is built here, it's going to be here forever. Um, he may not, you know, after he builds, he may not be here for very long. He might sell and move on. And, um, but this neighborhood is gonna be stuck with these two, two homes that, that don't fit the neighborhood. Um, then going back to safety, um, I'm glad that a couple of y'all when you came to our neighborhood, notice that we have a, a very wide triangular median coming into the neighborhood. And um, it does stretch about 300 back. And that's where safety comes in because this is how we enter the neighborhood and the streets are pretty narrow. Um, there are a number of neighborhoods in town that have these small 50 foot frontage um, lots and you can take a look at Tuscany as a newer neighborhood, um, Tangerine as an existing neighborhood that's been around for a long time. And when you drive through those neighborhoods, um, you know, they're, the homes are kind of cr crammed onto the smaller lots. The driveways are a little shorter and you see a lot of big trucks parked on the street and it's hard to navigate through through Tuscany is, is one in particular that comes to mind because there are a, a lot of folks with big trucks live there and park in the street. And um, so, but this gentleman was, was fully aware when he purchased the lot of the deed restrictions. I'd like to speak too, if I may. I'm Gary Hall, I'm Eileen Stewart's husband. And we live on Iron Gate in Forest subdivision. Hoping you can hear me okay. Um, again, I, I do think visually you can see that that lot is meant for a single home, the same size as the other homes in the subdivision. Um, I do hope that the Planning Commission will deny this variance based on cosmetic reasons, if nothing alone, but also the expectations of the current residents in Lake Forest. It seems to me this, this owner of the lot wants to make a quick buck off the cost of the rest of our property values. And I don't think that is fair to the rest of the residents in Lake Forest subdivision. Um, addressing Mr. Caldwell's comment that having two houses on that lot wouldn't change the parking in any way. Well, logic would suggest double the cars. <laughs> You're gonna have twice the number of cars 
is for one house as opposed to two houses. And since people can own as many cars as they wish, I guess, there could be a lot of cars, there could be trucks, big trucks, you know, backing out into that, that, that road from a narrow um, driveway would seem dangerous to me. Having the double driveway cosmetically doesn't match anything else in the subdivision. So I'm, I'm really hoping that the Planning Commission will deny this request of variance. Thank you, Mr. Hall. Is there anyone else, Julie? Yes, so next we have um, Darla that we are promoting um, to speak. Darla, if you will um, give us your last name and unmute yourself, you can address the commission. Hi, yes, Darla Fox, F-O-X. Are you hearing me? Yes. Oh, okay. Okay, hi. Okay, so I um, am the new vice president of the HOA association. And um, my notes are, I'm gonna have to revamp a little bit. I have some notes here, but a lot of these things have been addressed already. Um, I guess, let me start with my number one was this uh, major safety hazard at the entrance of Lake Forest. And um, like the other folks said, the two homes which are gonna be smaller and the driveways most likely smaller too, they would be more likely to park on the street. And again, with the median there, I'm not so quite as concerned with them backing out, but as the pe people that are turning in, uh, just uh, yesterday there was a, a mowing contractor had a trailer and was parked in front of that lot. Actually, he was mowing the median and a car was in front of me and we were turning in off of nursery drive. He pulled in and immediately slowed down. And so that made me have to slow down. And I was literally kind of had my back end sticking out on nursery drive until he could navigate past the trailer. And then I was able to, to go in. Also addressing that the other homes are on that street and have to deal with the median. The other, there, the median only goes from the corner past these two lots. And then uh, I, uh, another one of your members uh, said she thought the third lot, there wasn't a median and that's, that's correct. So it would be the first home which has the parking pad. And so they can turn around and or park their cars there. But these other two, uh, would have the, what we are thinking, smaller driveways and the cars would then be parking on the street, which is directly across the median. So that was our concern with the uh, becoming a bottleneck and, um, you know, trying to get turned off of nursery drive and into our, uh, our entrance onto Lake Forest. Um, then also, I, I think y'all were addressing also the HOA rules and that you have not looked at those. Uh, but one of the things that was in the letter uh, that I sent in stated that in, in this particular uh, se section one, phase two, subdivision two, it states, no person or entity other than the HOA shall have the authority to combine or divide any lot in the subdivision. So again, I know the city has their rules uh, on you know what can be done and the and and how it can be done and but then I the HOA this this is plainly stated in that in that uh, section one phase two which uh, the the owner should have because when he bought the property or uh, uh, he should have gotten these uh, which we all do when we when we buy or build we get the uh, the deed restrictions for our section. So he should be aware of that. And then just some of the other concerns were the zero lot line home, which does not fit at all with the uh, look and style of the other homes on that street. Um, I believe the minimum square footage in this deed restriction says 1200 feet, which I'm sure would fit there. However, the average home on Lake Forest Drive is 21 
33 square feet. Some are a little bit bigger. There's none less than uh, 1,800 and something square feet. And the average fronted is, is 77 feet. So it would be a lot different looking. It, it just wouldn't fit in. And we also are afraid that building these smaller homes would devalue those larger homes that are on Lake Forest. I think uh, Mr. Uh, or Lane Stewart before me, uh, he mentioned that. Uh, and then one other concern was that if you all do grant this variance, that it would set a precedence for the other property owners to request and then expect to get their variance passed through. Uh, and we feel like our deed restrictions are in place to maintain the uniformity of the neighborhood. And so we just really don't want that to happen. I think that's everything I have on my notes. Thank you, Darla. Uh huh. Um, next. Anyone else? Yes. Next, we have Keith Williams. Keith, if you will unmute yourself, you can address the commission. Uh, good afternoon, uh, Planning Commission, Co Planning Commissioners, and thank you for hearing uh, hearing us. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Okay. All right. Well, uh, I, I don't have a lot to say. Uh, I think Miss uh, Darla Fox covered a lot of what I was going to say. Uh, to my knowledge, there's no lot in Lake Forest. There's no other lots in uh, Lake Forest neighborhood that uh, has like a A and B lots. Uh, these lots, there was supposed to be, when this was originally designed or platted or what uh, at the time, it was two lots. And the homeowner, you know, like was discussed earlier, should have been aware of this. And, uh, you know, that's pretty much it. it and it, and it is in the deed restrictions, uh, not to, to divide lots. And if you do grant this variance or, it, and, or, you know, even if the owner appeals and goes to city council and the city grants this variance, again, like uh, Darla stated, we're gonna see this happen over and over again. Uh, it's only one foot that's, uh, being separated at this time, but it will, you know, what's to say the next homeowner buys two lots and he just, he says, I want, he or she says, I want to make three lots and it all becomes about making more money. Uh, as, as a former planning commissioner, uh, I'm not just saying it because I've been on a planning commission, but I, even if I've never been on the planning commission, it's, it's pretty clear to see that this uh, does, uh, it, you're putting something totally different into this neighborhood. And it, it, it's right at the entrance, entrance way of the neighborhood, which even makes it worse. Uh, this is what people see when they go in. But again, uh, if, we, if this is granted for this homeowner to do, then like I said, we've got uh, so many lots out there that are still undeveloped that, uh, you know, you might be hit with all uh, types of, of variances. And, you know, it's, if you grant this one, it, it's just going to become a continuing issue, I see. So that's all I really have. I, I, again, I side with most everybody that we've talked to. We ask you to deny the variance and uh, hopefully the city council will do the same. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Williams. Is there anyone else, Julie? Yes. So um, next we have Ms. Uh, Ranjan. If I'm going to promote you, if you will um, also give the commission your um, full name. You, if you unmute, you should be allowed to talk. That's for Ranjan. J-A-N. You there? Their hand is raised, but they are not speaking, and I don't see any other hands raised. So I do believe you can close the public hearing at this time. Okay, you don't see anyone else? 
At this time, we'll close the public hearing uh, and reopen the item for discussion with the commission. A motion has been made to uh, approve the variance and it's been seconded. Are there any other comments or from any of the commission members? Um, uh, I have, I've got a couple, couple things I wanted to address with regard to some of the things that were brought up by the, the community speakers. Um, Julie, could you clarify what most people think of as zero lot line, I think of as the five foot setback. We really don't have any other than variance, zero lot lines where the building is actually sitting on the property line, do we? Yes, so our ordinance actually clarifies the two. Um, so if you, if it's, with the minimum five foot setback is for single family residential. So if you have five foot setback on one house and a five foot setback on another, that actually means that there's a 10 foot um, separation between the buildings and that's really rooted in fire, fire code and fire rules. Um, but we do have another standard that is completely separate than what is being proposed on this plat. And those are your patio homes and where generally you have the home built on one side of the property line and that's a fire fire wall um, or fire rated wall. And then the, the other side setback is 10 foot. So you still have these 10 foot setbacks between structures, um, but we allow the frontage to be a little bit more narrow uh, and but and that has a whole different set of, of standards and definitions and regulations as far as you know the the fire code um, and then those law those um, walls that are on that common lot line have to be fire rated and then there has to be easements uh, for um, maintenance so a good example of a row of patio homes would be on country the southern end of Country Club Drive. Um, that's that's a good example of patio. Off the golf, off off the golf course, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you for clarifying that. I, I, actually, it was a really good explanation. Um, uh, it was also brought up, and, and I'll defer to the legal minds on the, on the commission, um, but a homeowners association bylaws can't supersede law, whether it be city or state, correct? No. Okay, so even if the homeowners association said they can't do this, if state law allows for it, then that's why we're here talking, correct? Well, they're separate and independent. So the ordinance, and, and as far as, you know, us, you know, or the, the commission, you know, approving a variance or ultimately city council approving the variance does not wipe away his obligations to meet his deed restrictions. And essentially the homeowners association would have standing to pursue legal um, enforcement of those deed restrictions through through the court system. Well, they, they could challenge the planning commission's granting of a variance and the city council's variance granting if they chose to, based on their deed restrictions that none of the lots should be subdivided. Okay, but, uh, but that doesn't prevent the lot from being subdivided just because. Not from a legal standpoint, no. Okay. Okay. And then um, I've got two more things. Um, I, I think we we need to be careful as a commission. Um, that we don't assume, and I, I learned this the hard way some years ago when I was first on the commission, that we don't assume that we know what the property owner is planning on doing. I don't think we should assume that the property owner is planning on what kind of driveway he's going to have, whether it be a single car, two car, whether it's going to be 24 foot or whether it's going to be smaller than that. Uh, I don't think we should assume until we get information directly from any property owner as far as uh, designs that come through the planning office or anything like that, what a, a property owner is gonna do with the property. I think that's a slippery slope when we start assuming that we know what's in the mind of, of property owners. And um, I guess my last comment is, is uh, it, and, and I'd like some input if anybody else heard this differently, but I thought I heard uh, Brian mentioned that there's an architectural committee as part of the homeowners association. And if that's the case, the responsibility of that architectural committee within the HOA is to make sure that any structures that are going to be built uh, meet what the, the, the HOA uh, defines as an acceptable structure as far as minimum color of the front door, I mean, whatever the HOA states. Uh, 
that's kind of what I got from when I heard there's an architectural committee. Did anybody else pick up on that? I mean, I think that's really outside our purview. I mean, it's up to us to decide whether or not to grant this variance based on the five reasons we have to grant a variance and whether, you know, what someone's going to do with it or not do with it really is not in our purview. I agree um, with you hundred percent. From, and, and from my standpoint, these other homeowners, I mean, I well, do agree with you hundred percent, but the other homeowners are asking us to take into consideration that what might be built on these properties. Well, no, I think, I think what they're asking us to do is take into consideration the aesthetics of the neighborhood, the, right. the neighborhood as it stands now, which has single family homes on large lots. And I, I think that's what a lot of what they were talking about. And I think the other thing to do is go back and, and look at our review criteria for granting variances. And, I, and I'll just say number four, the granting of the variance will not have the effect of preventing the orderly development of other land. Well, right there, I think we, we, we say no to the variance right on that one. And secondly, that number five, there are special or unique circumstances or conditions affecting the land involved such that the strict applications of the provision of this chapter would deprive the applicant of reasonable use. That is, that's simply not the case. He, he can make total reasonable use of that lot as it is without having it subdivided. So I think based even on the, the criteria of review that we need to look at, that we should deny the variance. That's just my opinion. I'd just like to talk chime in for a minute. Um, one, I want to uh, say uh, to Ms. Vic that I agree that no assumption should be done uh, what someone would do. But I also believe when you read the um, the application and even what's sent to it, the intention is written in there of what uh, the owner says we would like to do. Um, but uh, I also thank you, uh, uh, Ms. White, for even mentioning, mentioning that right there, which you just mentioned on that um, because uh, I think we have to understand that there's a difference between civil and commissioners of what we always do. But, um, and that's why I didn't have a, a, a issue, you know, um, when it came to passing it, whether they were saying it was a safety only because they talked about the house that was next to the lot, but there's a house across, across, across from it too, in that same medium that doesn't have that turnaround, that turnaround aspect. Um, and um, in which my concern, I understand, you know, as a person that's a property owner and, and as a HOA, uh, uh, Ms. Julie, uh, um, I, I understand that. But, um, you know, just dealing with what we're supposed to go off of and look at, like I said, my only concern was the, the portion of dealing with the deed that was inside of the application. That was my, my, only, my, only, my only issue of concern about that, so. And I'd like to chime in. Uh, my concern with this is uh, something that Mr. Williams brought up. Um, he's had the deed restrictions. If we set a precedence of, especially in Lake Forest, in a developing neighborhood, you know, what stops anyone else from buying a lot, splitting it, building two houses and selling those, and then you have them kind of popping up throughout the back of the neighborhood? Uh, that would be my concern with with passing this variance. So I would, I would probably be opposed to it. That, that it would set a precedent and particularly in a developing neighborhood because there are a number of, number of lots not developed in that neighborhood. Yeah. Well, I challenge this, um, especially because we deal with a, a city that has no zoning. Um, so, you know, when you have no zoning, it's like, okay, so, but I challenge this, if there's a criteria and we have the staff that goes through the criteria and is saying that they're meeting the criteria from what the standard of what the ordinance of the statute is saying. We knowing that the bylaws is, even though that's a governing uh, document, um, but it's something that's su submitted into court proceedings. Um, uh, it's besides of setting the president, you may know whatever. My thing is that if we go by what the book says of what we can and what we cannot do, Unfortunately, the bad part about it of it is, is yeah, you might have a subdivision where something where something is approved, you know, um, because of what the what the the ordinance of the statute says uh, that that approves, and so they go through. And like I said again, you know, it, to me, it's not about the my heart goes out. It's not, but it's not about you know our feelings and our emotions of it. It's about what um, what what the procedures say that we should approve and what not approve, or what we what we should do going on that. Now, you know, so I understand and I hear that, you know, about setting the president, but my thing is that that's why we have uh, these ordinances and statutes. And if they pass that statute or uh, ordinance, then our job is just to say, oh, 
they they passed everything to staff. Now I do question, like I said, my question is looking in the statute or ordinance of what's questionable regarding, like I said, regarding the deed re, the read restriction, but for as other the things of setting the president and you know, I can understand it, but we don't have zoning, so. Are there any other comments from any commissioners? Uh, we have a motion on the floor to approve the variance and a second. I think uh, because of the nature of this and the, the discussion we've had, I'd like to have a uh, roll call vote on, on the motion. Okay, um, Michael Atkinson? Yes. Vic Caldwell? Mr. Caldwell, you're on mute. No. Gail Hode? Gail still with us? Gail? I saw her as an attendee. She was no longer a panelist for some reason. I, I, I was just looking to see who was here. Okay. There she is. Gail, the, uh, the vote is on approval of the yes, variance. I'm, I'm, can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. Can you hear me? Okay, no, I do not want to approve it. Hey, Dr. Hunt? Uh, I'm a no only due to the D uh, portion. Brian Olguin? No. Brian Rokita? No. Cindy Staley? No. And Marianne Wyatt? No. So that would be um, seven voting not to approve the variance and one voting to approve the variance. So the variance fails. Julie, who, who voted to approve? Michael Atkinson. Okay. I missed that part. No, wait a minute. I, I voted against the variance. He, he, he said yes, but he meant to vote no, yeah. I believe. Oh, okay. Well, I <laughs> said no. Sorry. Then it's unanimous. Anyway. Uh, the, variance. the outcome's the same, but we will make sure that the minute record is um, reflected. Right. Okay. The, the variance has not been approved. Let's move on to our. Uh, Third agenda item, it's a preliminary plat, and don't let's not get confused. This is a preliminary plat for Lake Forest subdivision, section two, phases four through seven. Can we have a staff report, please? Yes, we are bringing forth the preliminary plat for Lake Forest subdivision, section two, phases four through seven. This subdivision is going to be located northeast of US Highway. So back of the current Lake Forest edition. Currently, a portion of this preliminary plot is within the city limits as well as in our ETJ. The, the developer is proposing to develop this 42.37 acre track into 114 single family residential lots with seven HOA common areas. The preliminary plot is depicting production of 60 foot right away required to, for the construction and extension of five local streets, which are Silver Lake, Auburn Hill, Woodbridge, Iron Gate, and Pebble Brook. It's also proposing to add future dedication for the construction of one new local street, which would be Quarry Cove. Staff recommends approval of this preliminary plot as it meets all the minimum requirements for single family residential development contained within the subdivision ordinance. Open for questions. Any questions or comments of the staff? I make a motion to approve uh, to to vote or whatever. But we have to have our public hearing real quick first. Okay. Just about, uh, if there's no other other comments, let's open the public hearing on this agenda item. Is there anyone that wishes to uh, address the commission on this agenda item? You see I anyone, Julie? See any hands raised? Okay, in that case, we'll close the public hearing and we are ready for a motion. I make a motion to go ahead and, and to approve. I second. Seconded by Michael Atkinson. All in favor? Aye. Say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, thank you. Uh, we now move on to the consent of the agenda. And what I would like from someone, since we did deny the variance for Lake Forest subdivision section one, phase two, resubdivision number two, resubdivision number one. We need a motion to remove item D3 from the consent agenda. So moved. We're not going to approve the plat. Second. It's been moved and seconded. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? 
All right, please let the record reflect that consent agenda item D3 has been removed from the consent, consent agenda. Now, are there any other questions on the items left on the consent agenda? It would be approval of the minutes and approval of the final plot for Beck Williamson subdivision number one, which we- Move uh, that we accept the consent agenda. Uh, Vic Holler motion to accept a second. Second. Seconded. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? No opposed. Thank you. All right. Next, we have the monthly business development report. Well, we actually, if we could get a motion to deny, formally deny item D3, the Lake Forest subdivision. We had a motion to remove it. We approve the consent agenda. I'll make a motion to formally deny. Is there a second? There second. Vic seconded. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed. Okay. Sorry, next the develop, uh, monthly development report. This past month in December, we had three minor plots, three major plots, two site plans, and one action that went to council, which was the variance for North Heights edition, resub number 14. It was granted by council. Thank you. Timbers permit reports. We are slightly up for, I'm sorry, we are below on our MEP permit slightly from last year as well as our, fee, but our fees collected are slightly up from last year at the same time. Any questions? Any questions of Celeste on any of the reports? Yes, not. Um, are there any other items that the planning commissioners would like to bring up? Well, then I'd like to formally adjourn the meeting and thank everyone for their con contributions and presence and have a great Mr. month. Thank you. All right, thank you. Okay, take Bye. Care. Thanks to all of you. Appreciate your comments.